Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we gather on this, the fourth Sunday in the season of Lent. We are mindful in this season of our call to look within and with penitence and repentance to turn our hearts back to God as we journey with Jesus toward Jerusalem, toward the cross, and of course, the wonder of the resurrection. Today, I have a few programmatic announcements for you. First and foremost, the session is continuing to monitor the situation with COVID, but we are now in phase one of the reopening plan. In other words, Sharon, our office manager, and Adele, as well as Eric and myself, are all now keeping regular office hours at the church. Small group meetings are permitted for folks or groups under the 10, as long as you follow mask, distancing, and sanitizing protocols. If you'd like to schedule a meeting, please do so with Sharon in the church office. Sharon will be the clearinghouse to make sure that protocols are followed and that no, no, not too many groups are meeting at the same time. We continue with drive-in church this week, unless of course it's raining. If it's raining outside, please stay home because we will not be here and setting up the equipment. The good news is, is that our platforms from the church have arrived. And so we're looking forward to using them. And uh, it, should be, uh, it should be a lovely day if it's not raining. Also coming up will Holy Week worship. We will worship on Palm Sunday, Maundy Thursday, Good Friday Tenenbrae, and Easter Sunday. All of those services will be available online. We will have drive-in church on Palm Sunday, weather permitting, and on Easter Sunday as well. So please watch the weekly messenger for more information. This Thursday is Theology on Tap, a group of us who gather with our favorite beverage via Zoom right now, hopefully in the future somewhere else, but right now on Zoom. And if you would like to participate in Theology on Tap, send me an email and I'll send you the reading for this week, which is a commencement address given by author George Saunders. And that should be a wonderful discussion. It's a great time of fellowship. Send me an email at tom at gpctemple.org and I'll send you everything you'll need to join us on Thursday night. Now, let us prepare ourselves to worship God. Please join me in the call to worship. Friends, believe the good news. God loved the world. God loves the world. We are the beloved. So come with your tiredness, your frustrations, and your discouragements. Come with your doubts and fears and your longings. Come to discover yet again how Jesus reveals God's love and mercy. Come, let us worship the God of love.
friends, as we come to our time of confession, we know that we cannot, become, we cannot come before God unless we are first honest with ourselves about who we are, about the mistakes we make, and about how well or poorly we care for others. In this spirit, let us confess our sin to God and one another, joined together in the prayer of confession. Merciful God, you love this world so much that you sent your own son, Jesus of Nazareth, to live and die among us in order that we might have life. Forgive us for keeping that abundant life to ourselves, for jealousy hoarding your generous gifts, and for choosing self-interest over compassion for others. Teach us what it means to live as children of the light, being reborn by the power of your spirit. May we generously share your abundance with our brothers and sisters in need. Lord, hear this prayer and hear us now as we offer our confession in the silence. Friends, let God's love and mercy wash over you, bringing promise of new life and hope. Be at peace, for it is in Jesus Christ that we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now let us sing the Kyrie. source of all light. By your word, you give light to the soul. Pour out upon us a spirit of wisdom and understanding that being taught by, your holy, by you and Holy Scripture, our hearts and minds may be open to know the things that pertain to life and holiness through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The psalm for today comes from Psalm 107, verses 1 through 3 and 17 through 21. Please listen for God's word to you this morning. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those who redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were sick through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them, and delivered them from destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind, and let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and tell of his deeds 
with songs of joy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. This is the fourth Sunday in Lent. Lent is a time we encourage each other to pray and turn our focus on God. Symbols like this cross can teach us about God and help us to pray. Well, there's a fun holiday coming up. And this holiday uses a symbol that you know and a special color. Do you know the holiday? <laughs> That's right, St. Patrick's Day. Well, the symbol we see on St. Patrick's Day is a shamrock or the three leaf clover. And this shamrock has three leaves and they can teach us and remind us about the Trinity or God in three parts. God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, during the Sundays in Lent, we are singing this beautiful song at the end of our worship services that I taught you a couple weeks ago. Oh, Christ, surround me. Oh, Christ, surround me. Well, the words of this beautiful hymn are actually based on a prayer by St. Patrick called St. Patrick's Breastplate. And in the prayer, St. Patrick asks Jesus or Christ to be all around him. This hymn is so meaningful as a prayer. It reminds us that we can always ask Jesus to be near us, to be all around us, and to help us in everything we do. Would you pray some of these words from this prayer with me today? Let us pray. Christ be with me. Christ go before me. Christ be behind me. Christ be within me. Christ be beneath me. Christ be above me. Christ be at my right. And Christ at my left. Christ be in the hearts of all who know me. Oh, Christ, surround me. Oh, Christ, surround me. Amen. The gospel lesson this morning comes from the gospel according to John, the third chapter, verses 1 through 17. It is Nicodemus' encounter with Jesus. Listen now for God's word to you. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do the signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it come from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel? and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? 
No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. Loving and gracious God, your word is indeed a light to the path that lies before us. With open and repentant hearts, help us to receive your word so that living and loving as your children, we may be a sign of your love to this world. And now, O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts gathered together be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. In seminary, I had an enviable classmate whom I will call Jane. She excelled in every subject. And when I say excelled, she was at the top of the class. She was the consummate student. And at once I was lucky enough to be on her team for a Christian education project. Jane dotted all the I's, crossed all the T's, held us all accountable. And because of her, I'm convinced we got an A on that project. She was a shoe-in for all of the graduation awards and accolades. And as the time approached for the ordination exams, however, she became really quite nervous. Now, in the Presbyterian Church, when we go to be ordained, you take a series of four examinations in worship, theology, you know, what we know about God, polity, which is church government, and exegesis, which is a big word for biblical interpretation. She studied everything she could get her hands on. And she was one of those people who after every exam would say, oh, I know I just bombed it. But ultimately, she would get the best score in the class. When it came time to get the results for the ordination exams, the entire senior class rushed to the office where the scores were posted. Now we had been told by a very wise professor that get your score, but keep your mouth shut until you're out of earshot of other people. If you have something to celebrate, be quiet. If you have something that you need to work on, be quiet because you don't want to hurt someone else. It was good advice. And I was in line right behind Jane. And Jane got the results of hers and there was an instant reaction. It's as if she collapsed in on herself. She started weeping bitterly and ran out of the room. Well, a friend of mine and I went over to her. Are you okay? And the truth was, she had failed all four exams, failed them all. Ah, that was hard. She'd never failed anything in her life. Jane was one of those folks who was comfortable with matters of the head, but not so comfortable with matters of the heart. The exams in the Presbyterian Church were taking all of that head knowledge and translating it with compassion 
that would speak from the heart to a congregation. Nicodemus was one of those people. As a Pharisee, he was an authority on the law and the prophets. He was intrigued by Jesus, so under the cover of night, so he wouldn't be seen, he sought Jesus out. Something about Jesus moved him. He greeted him with an affirmation that he was clearly a messenger from God. No one could do what he was doing apart from God's presence. But Jesus, Jesus immediately challenges him. He said to him, unless you're born from above, unless you're born of the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom. Nicodemus, of course, was stuck in his orientation to the law. How can this be? How can any of this be? How can it be that as an old man, I would crawl back into my mother's womb? He couldn't get his head around what Jesus was saying. He had been so immersed in the law and the traditions that he couldn't make the leap from his head to his heart. Jesus, I am certain, with compassion, said to Nicodemus, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? He goes on. Because Nicodemus was stuck in his head, Jesus went there. And he pulls a reference from the book of Numbers, a reference from Moses and the people wandering in the wilderness. The people are complaining and cursing God and Moses. Well, God had had enough, and he sent poisonous snakes to bite the people of Israel. That's the stuff bad dreams are made of. But the people come to Moses, and they say, we've sinned against you and against God. Please pray for us. So Moses prays for them, and God tells Moses to fashion a snake and stick it on a stick and hold it up, and anyone who looks at it will be healed. It's a classic story from the wandering years of the Israelites in the desert. And as Jesus spoke these words, no doubt Nicodemus began to understand. He began to see, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up the cross. Nicodemus, oftentimes stuck between his head and his heart, Jesus went immediately to where Nicodemus could hear what he was saying. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. The radical nature of God's love was key to getting Nicodemus to move from his head to his heart. And we hear about Nicodemus later in the Gospel of John. After Jesus is crucified, it's Nicodemus who takes Jesus' body and prepares it for burial. No doubt, Nicodemus was born from above. To be born from above is to accept by faith the gift of God's unconditional love. This spiritual birth gives us eyes to see beyond the limitations of our humanity. It leads us to the cross where God's love is poured out for all of us. Unconditional love is the way of the heart that offers grace forgiveness in the face of condemnation. What a radical love. 
that even the likes of us, you and I, are benefactors. This love, grounded in God's word and written on our hearts, is ours. But to live out this love is quite a challenge. You see, the tension between living God's way of love and living by our rules in this world tends to muddy the waters. It draws us to a place of conditional love. You know, if you're good to me, then I will love you. If you follow the rules, I will love you. But if you mess up, if you make me mad, then I will withhold my love from you. Conditional love is exclusive and short-lived. Conditional love leads us often on the outside looking in. I hearken back to a time when I was exploring my own faith as a youth. I had become a Christian and I was part of a good church, but I wanted something more, something exciting, something where I could just be invigorated. And so I started to gravitate toward a Pentecostal church that was opening in our area. A lot of my friends from school were going there and I was intrigued. I went to church there and it was vibrant and alive and I wanted to be a part of it. And so I, I went and, and the whole scene was much different than what I was familiar with in the Presbyterian church. They invited me then to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This was new for me. I thought my baptism was enough, but this baptism, they said, would bring the gifts of the Spirit. So I went through a ritual and it was crazy. People all around me were speaking in tongues and languages I couldn't understand, and they laid hands on me. It was a little scary, but I felt like I belonged. I was excited to be part of this movement. Weeks went by and nothing happened. I was told I would get this gift of speaking in tongues, but it didn't come. And I asked a lot of questions and I guess that wasn't a good idea. I finally went to a friend that I knew I could count on and I said, what am I supposed to do? It's not happening. And he said to me, well, it's clear that you don't have the faith to fully receive God's spirit. And with that, I was out. I was crushed. I was excluded. I was pushed out. And it reeled me back. I was so, so beaten. After a week, I finally got the nerve to make an appointment with my pastor at the Presbyterian Church. And after I told him what had happened with me and what I had been through and what I was feeling, he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, Tom, you belong. You are a beloved child of God. And no one can take that from you. Any gifts God has for you will come in God's time. Too many times, we like Nicodemus are torn between the head and the heart. Too many institutions are concerned with the rules and regulations, too concerned that they inevitably exclude rather than include. The love is conditional rather than unconditional, and it's fleeting. But God's love, unconditional love of Jesus, knows no boundaries, 
or limits. There's a story that comes out of Bedouin culture. Bedouin is the Aramaic for desert dweller. Folks like Abraham, Jonah, they were all Bedouins, living from oasis to oasis, taking care of their animals and flocks. They live in such a way that they require strong community. And there's the story of a young boy who in a heated argument with a friend, he strikes him and kills the friend. Knowing the ancient inflexible customs of the people, the young man flees, running across the desert under cover of darkness, seeking safety. After darkness rolls in, he goes to the tent of the tribal chief in order to seek his protection. The old chief took the young Arab in, and the chief assured him that he would be safe until the matter could be settled among the clan. The next day, the young man's pursuers arrived, demanding the murderer be turned over to them. They would see that justice would prevail in their own way. The chief looked at them and said, but I have given my word. But you don't know who he killed, they countered. I have given my word. He killed your son. The chief was deeply and visibly shaken with the news. He stood speechless with his head bowed for a long time. The accused and the accusers, as well as curious onlookers, waited breathlessly. What would happen to the young man? Finally, the old man raised his head. He looked at them all and said, Then he shall become my son, and everything I have will one day be his. That is unconditional love. The young man certainly didn't deserve such generosity. And that, of course, is the point. Unconditional love in its purest form is beyond comprehension. No one, no one, no one can merit it. It's freely given. The love of God, the unconditional love that transformed the heart of Nicodemus as he gazed upon the cross and encountered a love that was transforming. We all, all of us need to be born from above. But it's not a one-shot deal. God's love for us is relentless constantly pursuing us, extending over and over to us an unimaginable grace. Being born from above is not a one-time thing, but a living rebirth that picks us up when we fall, that calls us home when we wander away. This love manifested in our lives calls us to extend the same love to those around us. No exceptions, no exclusions. Nicodemus, a Pharisee, intrigued by what he heard and saw of this Jesus, this rabbi, this teacher, after being born from above, became a model of that same love. This is the transforming power of God's love. May we all know the joy that comes in being born of the Spirit. And may we all realize as we journey with Jesus to the cross and beyond that God so loved the world, you 
and I, that he gave his only son, that we may not perish, but that we will have eternal life. Thanks be to God. Amen. before we come to God in prayer, let us first share the joys and concerns of this community of faith. First, please pray for Robbie Osment, who had a biopsy this past week. Pray for June Church, who has been in the hospital. Continue to pray for Fancy Jessica's cousin, Billy, who is recovering from surgery last week. Continue to pray for Greg Mays and his health issues, as well as for his parents, Cliff and Diana. Please pray for those who continue to be affected by COVID, for members and family, and families uh, and friends of members, and those who have lost loved ones and essential workers caring for those who are ill. Please pray for those on hospice care, for Bonnie Martin Bowles, Helen Mann, Cindy Engel, Jim Harris, and Pat Roder and also continue to pray for those living with cancer. Ryan Smith, Mary Gall, June Church, Daniel Morgan, Stacy Hager, Tom Dunlap, Nancy Martin, Margot Gilworth Wyatt, Mary Roskilly, and Carol Hodge. And also continue to pray for our mission partners abroad, for Rubenia Sanchez in Guatemala, Paul Boats in Sudan, Yobet Hebert in Nicaragua, and also the Feed and Surf Ministry in Nicaragua. And also pray for our mission partners here in Temple for the work that they do. And please continue to pray for everyone who continues to be affected by the winter storms last month, especially for churches in our presbytery who are recovering from damages done to their church buildings. And also pray for safety and success for all those who continue to work for justice in this country. Now, friends, before we come to God in prayer, let us sing the doxology.
Pray with me. Sometimes, oh God, it seems as though we have too much, too much strife, too much anxiety, too many demands and problems, too many broken dreams, too much conflict, too much greed, simply too much to bear. And so here we are again, coming to you with that which is on our minds, thankful we can pray, thankful that you promise to hear us, thankful that being here reminds us we are not alone. We pray, O oh God, for all the nations of the world that you would guide those in power to set aside fear and greed and ambition, help them and help us to see the world and all of its children as yours, people in need of security, equal opportunity, people deserving, deserving of meaningful work and empowering education. Creatures in need of clean air and clean water and enough food. Be with communities, O oh God, still impacted by the winter storms last month. Be their refuge and strength through the agencies and workers providing aid. We pray for those loving God who struggle with anxiety and depression. Pray that each day they would see a glimmer of your light that would be enough to get them through just another day. Gracious Lord, be with people we know and love. Provide hope and assurance to those whose health is threatened. Be a gentle presence for those who have lost the love of their lives. Provide wisdom to those who are in need. Hear us now in a moment of our own silent prayer as we lift up the names of those friends and loved ones, especially in need of your grace. Lord of all compassion, we pray for ourselves as well, that you soften the places in our hearts that have become hardened, that you would replace cynicism with real hope, that you would teach us how you want us to serve you, and that you would grant us the gift of gratitude and joy. Bless this community just as you have throughout its history, preserving our desire to be of service binding us more firmly in your love and igniting us again and again to be your light to everyone who needs your light. We are restless people, O oh Lord, restless and wandering, sometimes up and down, sometimes hopeful and sometimes despairing. And so we need you. We know that even though we keep forgetting, remind us as often as is necessary that we do need you, but also that you do love us. We pray all of this in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Believe the good news of the gospel. God's love is unconditional and he extends it to each of us. Now go in peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God that will never let you go, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of us, now and forevermore. Amen. Christ in the hearts of all.